Today's segment of Sound Balming is brought to you by Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care. I cannot express to you how much we love, love, love their products. Although we use them all year, as the weather gets colder, we need these products even more. The dreaded drop in temperature, the dryness, the itchiness, and the unnecessary flakiness is inevitable. Shea Butter from Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care is the only thing that works for my skin and hair needs. Not only do these products cure my dry skin, the whipped butter goes on smoothly and doesn't leave that uncomfortably thick, sticky residue. Bonus? It smells absolutely amazing. There are so many different scents to choose from too. Not only do they carry skincare products, there are products for authentic living, face, shower, hair and beard, spritzers and perfumes, and bath products. Let me tell you, we cannot even keep the stuff in the studio. The entire production team, as well as all our children, use Jimmy and Mary's product. Jimmy and Mary's take pride in creating quality, handcrafted products from simple ingredients for the entire family. Their products are made for all skin types and are 100% handmade, 100% vegan, and 100% cruelty free. Skin care is important. Moisture is key and keeping our skin and hair hydrated is essential. I cannot emphasize how much we trust Jimmy and Mary's for all of our skin care needs. Hurry on up to JimmyandMary's.com and check out their products. Did I mention service is fast and efficient too? Don't forget to mention that you heard about Jimmy and Mary's authentic skin care on Sound Balmy. Use the discount code soundbalm20 to get 15% off. That's soundbalm20 for 15% off at Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Skin Care. Hey everybody, welcome to Sound Bombing. I created this show for people who want to experience a radical, life-changing journey through the sounds of my diverse guests. I hope that each sound you hear on this show will strengthen your faith, encourage your dreams, and challenge you to awaken the greatness within you. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values. And a new experience. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of the show, Lamar Darnell Shields. morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time of the day it is. Welcome to my show. I'm your host, Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields, the creator of Sound Bombing. And my goal with this show is to introduce you to people with ideas that will help you unlock your full potential. You know, my teacher mentor, who I got a chance to meet on one occasion, but felt like I've been knowing him for a very long time. He transitioned years ago, but my listeners know who he is because I quote him all the time. His name is Dr. Wayne Dyer. And Dr. Dyer said, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So sound bombing community, can we talk about change? Can we talk about problems just for a minute? I know. Why do I want to come on the show and talk about problems? Because, Because all of our problems are the same. Problems are forever and we can't avoid them. You'll wake up tomorrow and have problems for breakfast. You'll jump on the train, read a problem in your email inbox. You'll drive on the highway and see a problem at every exit. You'll then get to the office and get a problem, and it'll smack you right in your pretty face. Everyone has problems. Listen, Drake, ASAP Rocky, Kendrick Lamar, they had a song about problems. For the most part, we're able to quickly solve them without much trouble. We either come up with a quick solution or we use a strategy that worked in the past. For example, if you overslept in the morning and you're going to be late for work, you might decide to call for work and explain your situation while getting dressed and ready in half the usual time. 
Problems become more difficult when there is no obvious solution and strategies that you've tried in the past. They just don't work. These strategies of problems cause a great deal of stress and anxiety and require new and different strategies. There's basically a life hack for every problem. Did you hear what I said? There is a life hack for every problem. And so I invited the man who has dedicated his life to helping people solve their personal and career problems. I'm talking about Paul Cope. Paul is an author, entrepreneur, coach, and former corporate lawyer. He transformed his life after finding himself in his mid-30s, depressed and suicidal despite achieving everything we're told should make us happy. He tore everything down, spending thousands of pounds and money and hours and energy dedicated to find the root causes and why he felt unfilled despite the everything he had achieved. Luckily, he figured it out the secrets behind all of our problems in life. He's coached people around the world to change their lives using what he discovered through his personal experiences, working with the therapists, coaches, and learning from all corners of the globe. Paul has now written a seminal book to shake up the personal development world and help you transform your life. No matter what problem you face, his book, How to Solve Any Problem in Life, The Root Cause of Everything, will help you overcome it. So do you have a nagging life issue or problem you'd like to resolve? Whether it's a relationship, a problem you can't figure out, something where you just want done. Well, let me just tell you this. You're in the right place at the right time with my man, Paul Cope. Paul, welcome to Sound Bombing, brother. Let our listeners know how you are doing and let us know where you are calling in from. I'm great. After that, after that intro, I'm fantastic. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me on. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm, in, I'm in li- currently in Liverpool in the UK, in England. Holding it I'm down going. in the UK, Liverpool. Man, let's talk about COVID real quick. Man, how are you all handling this pandemic? Uh, I know you all are looking. I mean, we just got all this stuff going on politically about how leaders across the globe are handling the pandemic. Is, uh, is Liverpool doing anything that's out of the box when it comes to the uh, COVID pandemic? No, well, one of the fascinating things watching the worldwide stuff is it's, it probably reminds everyone in Britain how small the UK is compared to everywhere else. Because in lots of countries like the States, like Australia, y- your response isn't a nationwide thing, is it? Like every state has a different response. So you've got this, this sort of federal versus state by state thing. We're, we're a tiny island at the end of the day. So Liverpool doesn't get to do anything differently to the rest of the country because you know, we're only a, we're a three hour drive in a car from London. So you can cover the whole country pretty quickly. Um, I think if I, I could talk for hours about this, as I'm sure everybody could. <laughs> I think British people as a whole, I don't like to, I don't think stereotypes help anyone, but as a whole, I suppose you have a reputation for being quite stoic and just getting on with things. There is good and bad in that, as there is with everything. Um, as look, as lots of the world is, which is one of the reasons I, I wrote the book I've written. It's a divided country right now. So, the city I'm from is not a is not a huge conservative party Boris Johnson fan, um, and and the country was divided before this. It's still divided now in some ways. There's been a lot of lockdowns here. Like compared to, and I've got friends and clients all over the world, and I think the UK is. We've been in lockdown now since before Christmas. We were meant to come out this week, and it's just been delayed. So I think. Are so you in a lockdown right now? Right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, I'm glad you're locked down with us, man. I mean, we need you in this world. You are the problem solving guru. So maybe the prime minister, the president of the US. Uh, maybe the czar and all these other countries can can really reach out to you because what I know from what I read about you, watching your amazing YouTube videos, you've dedicated your entire life and career solving problems. Why have you done that? You can do so many other things. Why have you decided to say, I am going to spend my entire life and career helping people solve their problems? Well, it, it, st- it started, I mean, the, the problem solving stuff started as, a, as just as a standard lawyer. I was a corporate lawyer. I was one of those kids without spending ages telling you the backstory. I knew from when I was little, I wanted to be a lawyer. Ended up going into law school, doing all that, working for big international law firms. Had a bit, had my own law firm, started my own company when I was 29. I, I often look back at, there's photos of me when I started the, the company. And I think, Jesus, like why, why would anyone give that kid 
like a law job to do. <laughs> I looked like I was about 12 years old, but you know, got into it, loved it at the time. And, and used to, even back then, used to, I'd have clients coming to me with all these problems and I'd be saying to them, look, you keep getting the same problem over and over again. Why don't we just solve the, the cause of it? And then you'll, you won't need to keep coming back to me, which was, that's not something lawyers tend to do. <laughs> lawyers like problems because they get paid more money. Um, and I was like, no, 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 let's solve it. So that then led on in my own life. I started reflecting on things in my mid thirties, as you said in the intro, I was, I always say to people at the point in life when my mum and dad were the most proud of me. So, you know, to the outside world, I had it all. I had a law firm with a city center office and a beautiful wife and I owned five properties and I drove a flash car and I made loads of money. And my mum and dad would be talking to their friends and they'd be very proud and everyone would be like, oh, you're poor. I used to have my, my parents' friends' kids would say to me at parties, we're sick of you. Like all we ever hear from our parents is, why can't you be more like Paul Cope? And, and at that point, when I was at that pinnacle, I was at my most depressed. Like in my private life, it was really dark. I was miserable in work. I was miserable at home. Nothing, nothing I did made me happy. I was suicidal. And it, it, at that point then in my life, I was like, well, I've got all these problems in, that I need to solve. So I started digging into all these. That's when I started working with a therapist and coaches and really getting involved in, I'd always been interested in psychology, but I wanted to go deeper than that. So I started looking all around the world at different methods of solving things. Um, and what I realized was all these different problems in my life. I always talk about like root, the symptoms at the top. So people will talk about, I'm unhappy in my marriage, or I don't like my job, or whatever it is. I, I, I struggle with money. And when I started following all of these things down to what the root cause was, I had this breakthrough one day and I was like, I remember I was walking my dog in a park and it was like lightning hit me. I'd been seeing a therapist, I'd been working with a coach. And I was like, wow, where it came to for me was it all comes down to the same thing, which is low self-worth, low self-esteem, whatever you want to call it. Basically the feeling that we're not good enough as a human. And everything else comes off the back of that. And that all traces back to our childhood. So something you said in the intro, which I love, and I talk about all the time. And, and in the world we live in now, this message needs to be said more and more. We are all humans, no matter where we're from, no matter what we look like, no, man, no matter our race, our nationality, our gender, our sexuality, we all have the exact same problems. And I, I coach people from all around the world now, and it's incredible to watch how one of the biggest problems we have as a civilization is we all think our problems are just our problems. And I sit in a very privileged position now because I get people come to me and tell me their deepest, darkest secrets. And one of the things I get to say to everyone, which always makes people feel better is, this is nothing I haven't heard before. Like it's, it's the same, no matter where you're from, no matter what you do, it's the same. Why do people think that their problems are so unique? I mean, they think, that, oh, I'm the only one that's going through this. And then and I hear people say, no, I, I hate to go through this. Like, would you want this? Would you want someone else to go through what you're actually going through? I mean, nobody's in line. Like, let me just take your problems. Why do then people, what have you discovered about people thinking that I'm the only one going through this particular problem and situation? And when they do, when they are stuck in that, Paul, what do you do? What do you do then to get them out of that? I think that the first part, there's a combination of things and it's, one of them is an old thing and one of them is compounded by a new thing. So the old thing is most of us are raised in some way to think we're special, to think we're different. It, it often, and this, I often, I always say to people, this is not anybody's fault. This isn't like beating up everyone's parents. This has been passed down through the generations. The problem with that is if you think you're special and different to everybody else, you naturally think that you can't share things with other people. and and, it, and that's helped, that adds to the, these problems my own. The modern day thing, which massively adds to this is social media, because nobody, well, very few people post day-to-day -day problems on social media. We generally have, Joe, you know, the, the Instagram life, the Facebook life. Look, my, it's amazing how often my mum will say to me, oh, such a body, they're happily married. And I say, how, how do you know? And she says, well, they look happy on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and I always say to her, when was the last time my mum and dad were 50 years married a few weeks ago? I said to her, when was the last time you posted on Facebook about an argument you had with my dad about the dishwasher? And she says, well, why would I put that on Facebook? I 
I said, exactly. Like you and dad have the same arguments all the time. Me, me and my sister joke about it. We've been having the same arguments for 50 years, but that doesn't go on social media. So all you see are the people and it's easy to believe everybody else is happy and you're not. Yeah, I just had Sid Garzman Hillman on my show, amazing speaker and teacher. I wrote several books about self-empowerment, about empowerment. And he talked about how social media is not social at all. I mean, I was like, I thought about that because I, I read and write about social depression, social anxiety. Well, not just social depression, but it's Facebook depression, which is a real thing. Social media depression. And when Sid said it's not social at all. And I was like, it really isn't because people are creating these fake lives for themselves and they don't believe it. And, they, and then other people are buying into it. And then they're going into this, quote unquote, funk thinking like oh, Paul's parents are amazing they're they're doing this or or paul's sister is doing this and then deep down inside we know the real story it's not to throw anybody under the bus but you know we're going to be transparent about the beauty of the things let's also be transparent about the ugliness and that's why i like to bring i like how you immediately talked about your depression your anxiety your struggles and your challenges because people like you and i are on these stages day to day and many people aren't talking about their stuff they're not talking about, so they, they wonder why people are not following them, you know, in, in the way that they want to be followed. They're listening to them, but they're really not following because they're not being as transparent. I want to hear people like you would say, yes, I'm selling out arenas. I'm selling out all these books. I'm doing all these great things. I'm on all these shows, but man, at, at, when I go home, I'm struggling. I was listening to an interview about Andre 3000, I, you know, hip hop artist from Atlanta who's known all over. And, you know, he just disappeared from the music industry, just disappeared. and what I discovered, he has social anxiety. And Paul, and I'm trying to explain this to my son, Andre 3000, one of the most eloquent actors, writers, uh, performers. I mean, he's like a new Jimi Hendrix type of guy. And I'm trying to explain to my son. He said, but why would he be afraid of crowd, a crowd? He's an artist. Why would he not want to be in front of him? Because he struggled with some things as a young man that he didn't deal with. And they are manifesting as you're getting older and older and older, especially with COVID kicking in, there's no crowds. There's nobody out there cheering you on. There's, there's no arenas to sell out. So what you have is yourself and all the thoughts that are going through your mind on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we sort of struggle with that. So speaking of our thoughts, I know you are teaching people uh, as we talk about transforming our lives and also being a problem solver. What are some of the questions that we should be asking ourselves as we're, tr as we're attempting to solve some of the life issues that we're having on a day-to-day -day basis. And what are some questions that you ask yourself to help you then write the book that you did write? So it's a, it, the, the story you told about Andre 3000 is a great segue into how to, how to solve all of this, where, where does it, what happens. And the, I often talk about magic tricks. One of the problems in life is that life's like magic tricks. When, when we, there's a big long story about this in the book, which probably I haven't got time for, but. Generally speaking, when people try to figure out how a magician does a magic trick, the problem is they're looking in the wrong place. So they look at the end of the trick. I used to do magic tricks and one of my friends in uni hated it because all these people would be like, wow, how did you do that? And he'd be, he would hate that, me getting all this attention. So he would stare at my hands and be like, I'm going to figure it out. And I'd, I'd always say to him, you, can't, you won't figure it out that way. And it's because you're looking in the wrong place without ruining magic for most people. Lots of magic tricks. By the time you see the trick, the magic's already done. What you're watching is just a show. And that's what life basically is. We have all of these things going wrong in our lives and we focus on them. So it's like, I have a problem with money. I have a problem with anxiety. I have a problem in relationship. And we focus on that thing and think we can fix it that way. And I always say to the people I work with, that's the wrong way to look at it. It's like a magic trick. The, the actual trick was done 30 years ago in your childhood. So no matter what people come to me with, we don't look at that thing. We go back to childhood. We go back to trauma that we all experience. And this is something else about life. I, I had a lovely childhood. Like this is, I used to read stories, Joe, people who've, I'd read autobiographies of people who'd come through abusive backgrounds and cre done great things in the world. And I'd be like, that's a fantastic story, but it doesn't resonate with me because I had a nice childhood. And when I realized in my mid thirties, I had all these problems. I was like, well, how does that make sense? Because I had a nice childhood. And as I dug into it more and more, I was like, it's because childhood is traumatic for everybody. Being a child in itself is a traumatic experience. The problem we have as adults is we look at childhood through the eyes of adults. 
and not through the eyes of children. And when you look at childhood through the eyes of children, everything's traumatic. Think about it, like even just walking around. If you, if you go down to a child's height and look up at the world, it's like, wow, this is frightening. I, I know, isn't it, man? You know, and there, there's this concept that I learned because I'm an educator. Uh, when you're working with little kids, you get down on their level, like you've been down. That's why I love, you know, pre-K and uh, first and second and third grade. You get down to their level. And when you think about it, we are like giants to yeah. children. And so even when we raise our voice, or even if we're just talking a little loud or louder, it makes them nervous. And so I love how you said getting down really, really low and realizing sort of where we are. So then we can elevate ourselves at the same time. Absolutely. Mm. On, on that point, I went to see some friends at the weekend and I haven't seen them for a year and they, they'd had a baby. So I saw her when she was newborn before lockdown. I haven't seen her for a year. So she, she doesn't know who I am. She, she'd woken up from a sleep. They brought her outside and present, like basically pointed her at me. And she's like, not interested. They're like, say hello to Paul. She's not interested. And I was saying to her, think about that. I said to my friends, think about this from an adult perspective. Imagine if you went to sleep and when you woke up, a giant picked you up out of your bed and then just presented you to another giant who you've never seen in your life. How would you react? Would you smile or would you be like, I don't want to go near that giant. No, I'm not interested. And they were like, oh yeah, I've never thought of it like that before. This happens to children all the time. They go asleep. We put them in a, in a pram or a buggy, push chair. We take them to some other place. They wake up. They've got no idea where they are. They don't know who all these people are, all these loud noises. I mean, we could go on and on about this. Childhood is effectively traumatic. So to, tagging into the Andre 3000 thing again, which is a perfect example. Superstars are brilliant examples of the work I do because what we start doing as children is we start adapting to the surrounding, to our environment. So our, our system inside, I always say, think about it. One of the biggest lies we're ever told is that there's just one of us and there isn't. Rather than think of us as just one person, think of it like this is a big machine and inside your head is like a control deck. So it's like the, you know, the, the Starship Enterprise or a thing of Star Trek. Think of like the captain on there and the team running your, your system. As a little kid, when you can't face something, so you're, you're, you may be an introvert, loads of, I was an introvert. Most kids are quiet and shy. The world's very noisy and loud. So the team in your head says, don't worry about it. You can't handle this. We're going to build someone else. So we start building new characters, new personalities. And from a young age, we create all these different parts of ourselves. And then those parts do things for us that we can't do. The real version of us can't do. And that's how we end up. I always say to people now, we only talk about multiple personality disorder, which that's not what it's called anymore. It's called dissociative identity disorder now, but that it, it makes more sense to people when you call it multiple personality disorder. People think that the, dis the disorder is that you've got multiple personalities, but it's not. We all have multiple personalities. I remember when I first heard of this, I was, when I changed my life, I went to Bali for a few months and I was investigating different things. And I was watching a girl do a presentation and she, she talked about this for the first time. She said, when you think about these personalities, she said, I've got one in my head. I like to name them because then you can associate with them better. And I call this one, the, the personality in my head who likes to complain, I call her Susan because I used to work with someone called Susan mm -hmm. who complained. And she said, so the best thing you can do is think of names for your personalities. And I started laughing to myself because I thought my personalities are so pronounced. They're so prominent. They already have names. So my name's Paul Cope, but most people I've ever been friends with would call me Copy, my nickname. And when I was sitting there, I thought, he's an entirely different character. He was the character that my control deck created to be an extrovert, to, to operate in a loud world, in a loud family. So whenever I was in an environment where the shy, introverted me didn't want to be, Copy would come out. I always say when you think about this for yourself, and it's always good for people listening for you even, think about which of your personalities pop up as you think of this. I, and I always say the first ones you can think of are like your rock star personalities, but the ones in your life you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Because the real me actually likes to just sit on the couch watching TV and eating popcorn. Well, but I know one. Of, I know one of your personalities is that you are a huge soccer fan, <laughs> and I've watched. I've watched you talk and read blogs about one of your big personalities. You love soccer, and as a soccer fan, what is the game of soccer 
taught you about solving problems or or how can sports improve one's complex problem solving abilities? So for sports fans out there, I, I love sports analogies are my favorite way to talk to people about this stuff because one of the things i think is a problem in this space is some people get too like spiritual and woo woo about it all which turns off a lot of people and some people get too scientific about it all which turns off other people so i like to try and talk about this stuff in a way that connects so you know you can talk about things that people understand and sports a big one for that and to jump straight into it like a specific example there's something i always talk about there's maybe the most famous footballer on the planet or one of them lionel messi one of the things we do in life and this is this is a very a very small section of what i do but one of the things we all do in life is without realizing it we expect ourselves to be perfect so if we apply for a job we expect to get that job if we swipe right with a girl or guy on tinder we expect to end up going out on a date with them we expect things to go our way. If you look at any famous sports star, like the best soccer player in the world, Lionel Messi, maybe arguably the greatest player of all time, to score one goal, he takes on average six shots. And he's arguably the greatest player ever out of billions of humans. So even he needs six goes to get it right. And the difference between him and players who aren't as good as him is that when he misses the five, he's okay. He smiles. And loads of the work I do is about this. It's about repairing your own self-esteem so you feel good enough no matter what you do. So you can try things then. And if, this is where I talk a lot about being content and peaceful. Something in my old life I never had. I had success, I had money, I had material possessions, but I was never content, I was never peaceful. And it's because I, I never felt good enough. I always needed more. Once you feel good enough, it can, gives you complete freedom because all of a sudden you can start saying in your life then, what do I really want to do? What do I want to try? What are the things I would do if I wasn't afraid of failing? And that makes you, you become like a sports star. Michael Jordan's brilliant at this. If you look up Michael Jordan's stats and always whatever sport you like, look at the star, the big star. Look at how many points they ever scored. And then look at how many shots they missed. I, I, and they I always missed so many more shots than they ever scored. Well, I love that uh, analogy. Well, you were bold enough to take on something huge, and that is writing a book entitled How to Solve Any Problem in Life. Now, if I was walking through the bookstore, which I typically do, and I'm like, hold up any problem in life, <laughs> how to solve any problem in life, the root cause of everything. Let's talk about this book. I know you've written several books. I know another book, The Seven Secrets to Change Your Career. But I want to I want to park park right here because I'm walking through Barnes and Noble. I'm walking through the books. I'm, or I'm, or I'm scrolling through Amazon and I'm like, any problem in life? Let's talk about that. How, Paul, um, how, how, what have you discovered um, as you were writing this book? Uh, what have you discovered about the individuals that you've coached, the individual individuals that you watch that then motivated you to write this book, How to Solve Any Problem in Life? Well, interestingly, this this ties into COVID actually and lockdown because mm -hmm. so go back, rewind over a year. I'd been working with coaches. I'd completely changed my life. Where I realized I wanted to go was public speaking. I, I was a really quiet, shy little boy. So if I do say that to people when I was little, they'd be like, no. Now, what I realized for me is public speaking is like that perfect blend between nerves and excitement. So I, I feel alive when I'm doing it. I feel energized. And then the world locked down. So I was like, oh, no, I can't do that anymore. What else can I do? And because I'd, I'd come up with these theories in my own life about self-worth and solving problems, I thought, you know what? I, I was a business coach for a while after being a, after being a lawyer. I think I'm going to, I'm going to see if this works for other people. And I reached out and I offered some free sessions to a few people, different people got in touch and it grew from there. And that's what led to the book because what coaching people on using the philosophies I developed did was show to me that it works. 
and people were coming to me from all over the world with completely different problems. One guy addicted to drink and drugs, uh, someone depressed, suicidal, someone hadn't spoken to their dad for 10 years, someone needed to change careers, all these different problems that all seemed like they were, Joe, when we talk about the magic trick, all seemed like completely different things. I was like, let's park that and let's talk about this other stuff. So we would talk about this other stuff. And I, I often say it's like the original Karate Kid movie. You know, you go, you go to learn karate and you, this guy's got you painting fences and sweeping the floor <laughs> and washing his cars. And you're like, I want to learn karate. And at the end, he's like, you've been learning karate, look. And that's a lot of what, the, what this does. Loads of it's counterintuitive. We do all these other things. And when you pull it all together and you, re, you repair self-worth, I had one of my favorite stories I love to talk about. The guy, he was, he was addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol. And he said to me, look, I've worked with a therapist. It's not working. I am going to lose my family. I've got a little boy, girlfriend. She's going to leave me. She's going to take my kid. Can you help? I was like, look, we'll do the work. Let's see where it goes. Eight weeks later, he, he came onto a call with me and he, he was laughing and he said, do you know what, Paul, this is, it's amazing. He said, I'd for, when I came on this call, I'd forgotten why I got in touch with you. He, had, he said, I don't think about drugs anymore. And I said, that's great. And he said, but there's something more interesting than that. And I said, what? He said, we didn't talk about drugs ever. You didn't want to talk to me about drug addiction. And I said, I know it's because that's just a symptom. We, we talk about this stuff and it solves all these other problems and it ends up solving problems you didn't even think you had or problems that just melt away. And that's when I got to the point where I thought the biggest thing for me is helping people. If you do it one-on-one, -on -one, there's only so many people you can help. And I was like, well, what's the, what's the best way for me to get this to as many people as possible? Because I'm passionate about this stuff. So it's books, YouTube, podcasts. And for me then, no matter, no matter what your budget is, you know, the book's going to cost £15, $20. YouTube is free. The podcast is free. All of my social media is, will always be completely free because I want to get this information out to as many people as I possibly can. I'm writing the book. That's what it was, it was for. It helped to put this all into a structure, which then takes people right the way through what I do with them if I was coaching them one-on-one. -on -one. So in the book, as well as in your coaching practice, you talk about, and you just referenced it a few minutes ago, uh, your theory of solving problems, your concept. How, can you explain the basics of your theory and how it helps solve problems? Yeah, so it's, it's stuff we've touched on already, and it's, it seems so simple. And it's, it's that type of thing now where when I talk about it, because I've talked about it so often, it's like, didn't, we always, didn't I always know this? And then I realized I didn't. When I was 38, I didn't know any of this stuff. And when I speak to clients for the first time, like, no, I'd never thought of this. It's all about childhood. Everything goes back to childhood, traumas that we experienced in childhood. And, and when we say trauma, it's, it's that thing that I always sort of regale against that because I'm like recoil against that because it's, I don't, if you said, did I experience trauma as a child? I'd be like, no, not really. So I've, I've adapted and um, created new language in this book about, I call them programming experiences. So it's just things that happen to you when you were a kid, because the smallest thing, going back to what we said before, the smallest thing to a kid is traumatic. It, all it takes is for your parent to say something to you that deep inside yourself made you feel like you weren't loved or made you feel like you weren't good enough. And this adds up over time. Shame is a big part of this. We teach our kids that without realizing it, that certain emotions are not acceptable. You're not allowed to be angry. You're not allowed to be sad. You're not allowed to be afraid when these are just perfectly normal, healthy emotions. So we learn to be ashamed of parts of ourselves and we just learn fundamentally that a part of us isn't good enough. So the solution, which is where all the work is, and it's part of the personality stuff we touched on before, is learning about who you really are to begin with. It's quite, it can be quite dark, the work, because people often say to me, are you a life coach? And I, I always sort of back off from that as well, because in my head, life coaches are people who, tell you to be positive and tell, tell yourself you love yourself. And there's, there's room for that. Don't get me wrong. And whatever works for you, I always say, if something works for you, do it. It's got my back in. I love it. Mm -hmm. But the work I do is actually, there's a lot more darkness to it. It's looking at yourself and finding out who you really are and facing the darkest part of your own personality, which counterintuitively sets you free. Mm -hmm. And that's how you then can change anything in your life.
So I want to hear your steps now. As you approach a problem, uh, you're this problem-solving guru, and someone is listening out there, and like, they're like, well, I want to hear him walk me through his steps. So, Paul, what steps do you take before making a decision on how to solve a problem? And then why do you decide to take those steps? I know one of the things that you that you did that I read about is you reignited your mojo by running a marathon. I'm a runner. You a runner. Well, I'm doing more walking now uh, just for a variety of reasons. But walk us through the steps that you take before making making a decision, because I think that's where the pitfalls with many people. They 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 take these steps and then they don't get the solution. But then what they don't realize, Paul. Is like you talked about the karate kid is that they learn all these other things throughout the process. So walk me through your process of making a decision and solving problems. And then why do you go that route? So the, f- the first one that springs to mind, which is, which is one, this actually goes back to when I was a lawyer as well. Most people, it goes back to the magic trick thing. Most people, when they bring a problem to me, they bring me in the middle. So they'll bring me a problem. They'll say, this is the problem. And I say, is it? Let's go back. Let's go back three steps. Because, so let me give you a business example that someone came to me with a while ago. They came to me and they said, "Um, we want to sell our company and we've got a problem that the the buyer's causing us issues and it's it's giving me sleepless nights. Can you help us solve that problem? And I said, is that the real problem? And they said, yeah. And I said, let's go back three steps. Why do you want to sell your company? And when they started telling me about why they wanted to sell their company, and I started asking them questions about that, they realized they didn't want to sell their company. <laughs> so if we'd have just gone into which, what most lawyers would have done back then, which is, okay, I'll help you solve the problem about the buyer, they would have solved the problem potentially, but it wouldn't have made them any happier because they're solving the wrong problem. So the first thing we do is make sure that we're solving the right problem. Go back to the beginning. What is it we're actually looking at? And then this is part of the, the second part of the book, actually. The, the two biggest things I say to people when they want to do this work are one, take absolute responsibility for everything in your life, everything. And I mean radical responsibility. No matter what it is, no matter how much you're trying to blame somebody else, say to yourself, okay, how, how can I do something about it? What, it? what is my part in this? And the second part, which is huge, if I could give everybody, I was, I was observing everybody I'd worked with over a year, and I thought the difference between people who make rapid progress, everyone makes progress, but people do it at different speeds. And the difference is, if I could give everyone a pill that did this, I would. It, I call it the be kind to yourself program. So what, what we're doing in, in this work is we're, we're taking away the programming we've had since we were little kids to be the way we are. We're, we're removing that. And we're putting in new programming, and the most important program is be kind to yourself, because without that program, everything else is more difficult to do. You don't. We don't realize. And this was a big shock for me when I started doing this work. How nasty we can be to ourselves inside our own heads, and it it disguises itself. We call it things like drive, ambition, determination. But I, and I used to say all those things about myself. When I stopped and paused and reflected, what I was actually doing was really being mean to myself. Nothing was ever good enough. And I would think, well, if I spoke to somebody else like that, I wouldn't be very pleased with myself. So the the big thing is start being kind to yourself because that allows you then to do things and make mistakes and go, it's okay, step by step. Well, here we go. The transformation leader helping us to solve the problems. And I am learning so much radical responsibility, being kind to yourself. Great messages here. I can talk to you forever. Paul, what are your final thoughts for our listeners? And uh, before you give our, before you give our, your fi- our final thoughts to the listeners, let, let, them, let my listeners know how they can get in contact with you. Uh, if they want to be a client of yours, if they want to watch your YouTube videos, if they listen to your podcast, and if they want to get a copy of your amazing books. So as I, as I said, the, the, my big thing is to get this stuff to as many people as possible without it costing them anything. So my socials are all about to, to start ramping up again for the, for the launch of the book in a couple of weeks. So you'll find me on any platform with uh, the tag Paul with the number seven, Cope, C-O-P-E. 
My website is paul7cope.com. And if you put forward slash free chapters, you can download the first four chapters of the book completely free. So you can have a look at it. You can have a read of it. You can listen to it if you prefer the audio version before even deciding whether it's for you. Because something I always say to everybody with this type of stuff, it's got to be the right time for you in your life. And, and even if you do, if you listen to this and you think, do you know what? It is the right time, but I'm not the right person. That's okay as well. It's really important to find people who you resonate with. And those people will help you change your life more than anything else. And ultimately, the biggest message in that, going back to the, the responsibility, it's on each of us. This is something we've got in the world right now. I see a lot of, this is a social media thing as well, is we point the fingers at everybody else to change the world. Like you all need to be kinder to everybody online. You all need to do these things. And if you do this, then we'll be better off. It all starts with us. If something I talk about in the book is if every one of us changes ourselves, looks at our own darkness, where am I going wrong? What's my responsibility? And if each of us does that and the work that that takes and then helps one more person do the same, then we get viral growth and we get this spreading like wildfire. Well, Paul, I appreciate your message. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, the second part of the show is called the Super Bomb Questions. It's somewhat different from the first part. The difference from this part is brought to us by, uh, by Mountain Maid. I'm going to ask the questions. You need to respond as quickly as possible. But you're sharp, brother. I know you're going to be able to do this. So you ready? I am. Go on. Here we go. What's your favorite word? Oh. Uh, the first one that came into my head, is, I'll just say it, was is supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> there we go. What's your favorite quote or verse from a from a holy book or a verse from a song? Oh, God, so many of these. I should pick one from the book. Um, oh, let's go. Let's go with one from my home city. All you need is love. Mm. What's your superpower? Oh, <laughs> I always what? No, I always wanted the ability to fly or see through walls, but. The one I got was, I think, the ability to take in lots of complex, complex information and explain it to people in simple ways. What's your spirit animal? Monkey. What moves you to tears of joy? Oh, laughing with kids. What moves you to tears of sorrow? That's a big one. Uh, pain in the world. What do you wish you had more time to do? Nothing. I've created a life where I've got all the time I need. What is the book or books you've given most as a gift and why? Oh, okay. So big one, uh, Letting Go by David Hawkins, my favorite book of all time. Um, highly recommend it. Huge, that was a huge step in, in the new part of my life. Massive about emotions and how letting go and accepting things can change your life. How do you express gratitude with those you love? Uh, hugs and tell them, tell them you love them. If you were in the Mr. Um, if you were in the Mr. UK talent competition, what would your talent be? <laughs> ah. <laughs> God, that's a good one. I can, I've been learning guitar. I do that. Play the guitar. All right, Paul, I appreciate you hanging out with me. It has been a blessing and an honor to learn from you. Go out and pick up his books. Go out and listen to his podcast. Go out and talk to him. He is available and look at, read all the blogs that he writes about from sports to transformation to being a better person. And you will definitely, definitely grow because I've grown listening to him. And I cannot wait to go into the studio and editing studio to listen to it one more time. So, Paul, I appreciate you hanging out with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I would like to thank my engineer, Alexander Block, my super duper producer, Nicole Klimpaka, Supremacy for our theme music. But I cannot do this without all of you. Please, please leave a comment. Subscribe. Stop being stingy. Share us with all of your listeners out there. We're on every platform. If you want to know more about me, go to drlds.com drdrlds.com. And listen, go out and do something for someone other than yourself today. You have been listening to Sound Bombing. Peace. The Super Bomb Questions.
are brought to you by Mountain Made CBD. Mountain Made is changing the CBD game by offering a line of high dose CBD tablets at an affordable price. Their products are THC free and third party tested for accuracy, cleanliness, and potency. Their products, which ship nationwide, include Build for CBD saturation, Boost for precision titration, and Recover for rest and rehab. With nine years experience in hemp and fitness, Mountain Maid's founders are focused on creating a quality product to help those who live an activated lifestyle. Check out mountainmade.life. Again, that's mountainmade.life to find out more about how their products can help you crush life. Remember, their products ship nationwide. Go check out their website today and follow them on social media at Mountain Maid. That's the at symbol M N T M A D E. Our staff at Sound Balming uses Build before our morning workout, which helps to push our bodies to a whole new level on a daily basis. Try Build, try Boost, try Recover. Our staff is using these products to enhance our active lifestyle naturally, and we are crushing life with Mountain Made CBD. And you can too. Start today by going to mountainmade.life and ordering Build, Boost, Recover, or the multitude of other products that they have which will enhance your lifestyle. I promise you, you won't regret it.